Chapter 4, Transcendental Knowledge, text number 21. Nirasir yata chitatma Nirasir yata chitatma Chakva sarva parigraha Yatva sarva parigraha Tatva sarva parigraha Tatva sarva parigraha Shari ram kevalam karma Shari ram kevalam karma Kurvan napnoti kyobisam Kurvan napnoti kyobisam Nirasir yata chit atma Nirasir yata chit atma Chakva sarva parigraha Chakva sarva parigraha Shariram kevalam karma Shariram kevalam karma Kurvan napno tike obisam Kurvan napno tike obisam Nirashir yata chit atma Nirashir yata chit atma Chakva sarva parigraha Shari Ram Kevalam Karma Shari Ram Kevalam Karma Kurvan Napno Tikil Bisham Kurvan Napno Tikil Bisham Jirashi Yata Chitatma Jirashi Yata Chitatma Takta Sarva Parigraha Takta Sarva Parigraha Shari Ram Kevalam Karma Shari Ram Kevalam Karma Kurvan Apnoti Kilbisham Kurvan Apnoti Kilbisham Nira Siryata Chittatma Nira Siryata Chittatma Tyakta Sarva Parikra Tyakta Sarva Parikra Shari 
शरीरम केवल कर्म शरीरम केवल कर्म गुरुवन्नाप्नोति किल विषम गुरुवन्नाप्नोति किल विषम निराशेरत चित्तात्मा निराशेरत चित्तात्मा यक्ता सर्वा परिग्रहा यक्ता सर्वा परिग्रहा शरीरम केवल कर्म शरीरम केवल कर्म Nirasa, Nirasa, Nirasi, Nirasi, without desire for the result. Without desire for the result. Yata, Yata, controlled. Controlled. Chitta Atma, Chitta Atma, mind and intelligence. Mind and intelligence. Trakpa, Trakpa, giving up. Giving up. Sarva. Sarva. All. All. Parigraha. Parigraha. Sense of proprietorship over possessions. Sense of proprietorship over possessions. Shariram. Shariram. Keeping body and soul together. Keeping body and soul together. Kevalam. Kevalam. Only. Only. Karma. Karma. Work. Work. Kurvan, Kurvan, doing, doing, na, na, never, never, apnoti, apnoti, does acquire, does acquire, kill bisham, kill bisham, sinful reactions, sinful reactions. Translation: Such a man of understanding acts with mind and intelligence perfectly controlled, gives up all sense of proprietorship over his possessions and acts only for the bare necessities of life. Thus working, he is not affected by sinful reactions. Purport by Srila Prabhupada A Krishna conscious person does not expect good or bad results in his activities. His mind and intelligence are fully controlled. He knows that because he is part and parcel of the Supreme, the part played by him as a part and parcel of the whole is not his own activity, but is only being done through him by the Supreme. When the hand moves, it does not move out of its own accord, but by the endeavour of the whole body. A Krishna conscious person is always dovetailed with the supreme desire, for he has no desire for personal sense gratification. He moves exactly like a part of a machine. As a machine part requires oiling and cleaning for maintenance, so a Krishna conscious man maintains himself by his work just to remain fit for action in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. He is therefore immune to all the reactions of his endeavours. Like an animal, he has, he has no proprietorship even over his own body. A cruel proprietor of an animal sometimes kills the animal in his possession, yet the animal does not protest, nor does it have any real independence. A Krishna conscious person, fully engaged in self-realization, has very little time to falsely possess any material object. For maintaining body and soul, he does not require unfair, he does not require unfair means of accumulating money. He does not therefore become contaminated by such material sins. 
He is free from all reactions to his actions. Om Jnanati Marandasya Jnanjana Shalakaya Chatsur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama Vanchakaupata Rupyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Kadhadhar Shri Vasati Kaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Translation again. Such a man of understanding. So this is referring to the previous verses which had been spoken by Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna was describing the attitude and the dealings of a person who is in perfect knowledge of his self, who has achieved self-realization and who is not attached to any of the results of his activities. So such a man of that understanding acts with mind and intelligence perfectly controlled. Mind and intelligence both have to be controlled. The subtle body is the mind, the intelligence and the ego is there. So these things have to be controlled. The practice of yoga is meant to control the mind and senses. The initial phase, phase of yoga, we have to learn to control the mind and the senses. And a mind and intelligence here is mentioned. The mind is directing the senses and the intelligence is higher than the mind. The intelligence directs the mind. Within our mind we may think so many things but the intelligence will say, oh no, don't do that, that will get you in trouble, don't do that. And so if we listen to our intelligence can guide the mind. And the mind, of course, directs the senses. The mind, in the, the classic example, is of the chariot. A chariot which is driven by horses. The horses are compared to the senses. Horses are very strong and powerful. Same way our senses are also very strong and powerful, very demanding. Prahlad Maharaj compares the senses to having five wives, the man with five wives, that each wife is saying, take me here, and each wife, different wives all want to go different places. So the tongue wants to go one place where you can, where the tongue will enjoy tasty things. The ear, they're more, in, they're interested in the sound, they want to hear the, the sweet music or whatever kind of music. And the eyes want to see the beautiful sight, you know. The, maybe some people like to go to mountains and see the Alps, you know, see the snow. Other people would rather go and see the sea, go to the beach. You know. uh, different things appeal to the eyes. And the same way the, the nose wants to smell pleasant aromas. What is pleasant will vary according to different people. Some people like fruits, the aroma of fruits. We used to make incense. When I first became a devotee, we supported the temple by making incense. We would make our own incense. And uh, the devotees from, uh, from the US had come and they'd shown us. And so we, in London, we were making our own incense. And some people, they will like strawberry aroma, and some people will like cherry, and some people like lemon, and some people like patchouli, or musk, or jasmine. You know, there's all different aromas. Some people want the very heavy, you know, powerful aroma, and some people want it should be nice and fragrant, like flowers. So, different tastes for different people. 
But it's all to satisfy the senses, you know, our senses like to enjoy. The nose likes the nice smell of incense. And some people want to touch the pleasant things, the, the sense of touch, to feel the soft, gentle thing. And in Thailand they say, as smooth as silk. You know, they talk about the Thai airlines, you know, they say, as smooth as silk, you know. <laughs> silk is very smooth, to this touch is very smooth. So, different sensations of touch. It's all satisfying the senses. But the, ma the man of intelligence, he will control his senses. The, the practice of yoga is to control the senses and the mind is in very, import very important in controlling the senses. Higher than the mind is intelligence and higher than intelligence is the soul. Intelligence is seated next to the soul. So the soul, our desire, our, the desire of every living entity influences our actions and our intelligence to act in different ways. So a person who is in full knowledge of his spiritual identity, he will, con he will control his mind and senses because he understands He's not the body, so he's not attached to the things which are in relation to the body because he knows, I'm a spirit soul, I'm not the material body, I'm a soul. So Lord Krishna says, such a person gives up all sense of proprietorship over his possessions. And materialistic people are very attached to their possessions. This is mine. This belongs to me, right? She is mine or he is mine. <laughs> you know, we have that sense of proprietorship. It's mine, my property. But we're, it, 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 they have a common saying in India, right? In India they say, Kalihat ayate, kalihat chalo. Right? You're born with nothing in your hand. When we come into this world, we have nothing in our hand. And when we leave, we'll have nothing in our hand. But in the course of our life, we're claiming, this is mine, this belongs to me, my property, my home, my kingdom, <laughs> my land, like this, my car. You know, Prabhupada always told, if you hit somebody's car, they'll say, you hit me, you hit me. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't hit you, I only hit your car. You know? But we, we identify with the cars. It costs so much money, no wonder you identify. You know? Very difficult not to be attached. But anyway, one who is in full knowledge of his self, who has realized his own self, he gives up all sense of proprietorship. He doesn't think, this is mine. He understands, whatever I have, it is by the grace of the Supreme Lord. He's given to, we accept whatever is given to us by his grace. And so, that, we have to become detached from this, these things, you know. This sense of thinking, this is mine, we will never be peaceful. In Bhagavad Gita, in the fifth chapter, this is only the fourth chapter, but in the fifth chapter, Lord Krishna will state the peace formula. And the peace formula is to understand that everything belongs to Krishna. Bhoktaram yagna tapasham sarva loka maheshwaram. Maheshwara. He is the proprietor of everything. Right? That everything is for his pleasure, it's all his property. And he is our best friend. That is the peace formula. If you know these three things, if you remember these three things, you can be peaceful. So here, Lord Krishna is describing the person in, who is self-realized 
he, he, he doesn't have any sense of proprietorship. He doesn't think, this belongs to me, this is mine, you've taken mine. There's a nice pastime about Ramanujacharya, the great Acharya from South India, that uh, there was one householder couple who were coming to the temple and Ramanujacharya was spending a lot of time talking to them and he found them to be very nice devotees and he spent a lot of time talking to them. But the brahmacharis who were in the ashram, they didn't like it that he was talking to these householders all the time. And they complained to him. They said, oh Maharaj, oh Guru Maharaj, why you give all your attention to these householder couples? We're the brahmacharis, you know. <laughs> but Ramanuja said, you don't know how advanced this couple are. They're very, very special devotees. And he told the, he told the brahmacharis, he said, just test them. You go to their home in the night and rob them. Steal all their jewelry. Steal all their wealth and see what happens. So the brahmacharis thought, okay. And they, went, they went to the couple's home during the night. They came, the couple were laying on the bed, supposed to be asleep. But actually, they, they weren't really asleep. And, but they saw these brahmacharis come in and they didn't say anything. And the brahmacharis came in and they were taking all the jewelry and they even tried to, took the jewelry off the wife, off, the, off of her neck. You know, she was wearing some jewelry. And, and at one point the wife moved and then the brahmacharis got afraid and they all ran away. And then the husband said to his wife, why did you frighten the brahmacharis? <laughs> and she said, I was only moving to the other side to make it easier for him to take the jewelry. <laughs> You know, they were so detached. And the next day, they went to the temple and Ramanuja asked them, is everything okay at home? Mm. Yes, everything is fine. They didn't complain about anything. They didn't say, no, we got robbed. Your brahmacharis came and robbed us. <laughs> they didn't say, they said, no, everything is fine. No problem at all. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any complaint. But then Ramanuja, the brahmacharis had their coppins, you know, the coppins which they wear, a few pieces of cloth, they were hanging up on the roof. And so Ramanuja sent someone up on the roof, he said, move all the brahmacharis coppins around, don't let them find their cloth, you must take some away. And so then the brahmacharis went on the roof and they were looking, hey, where's my coppins? Who took my cloth? They were all upset. And Ramanuja said, see, he said, you see, you're, so, you're brahmacharis, you're so attached to your coppins, you're so attached to your pieces of cloth, that those householders, they, they were not even attached to their jewelry, all their wealth. They let you take it all. You can see how advanced they are. So, like that, people who are in knowledge of the self, they're not attached to material possession because they understand these things are temporary. We're given them by the grace of God and they're taken by the grace of God. We, we just have, we're in the hands of Krishna. Uh, it said, God is like a person with ten arms. If he wants to take something, he can take everything. What can we do with our two arms? And if he wants to give something, he can give so much also. So we just have to surrender to him and accept what is his plan. He may give, he may take. We have to surrender and accept his, his doings. So one who is in full knowledge, he will act like that. He's not attached to his possessions. And then Lord Krishna continues to say more. He said, he acts only for the bare necessities of life. He acts only for the bare necessities of life. How the world would be different if people all acted like that. Could you imagine if everybody acted only for the bare necessities of life? You know, there would be no wars. There'd be no quarrels, you know. People could be, they'd be living in a very different world. 
So, of course, this is described in the Upanishads, in the Isha Upanishad. It says, uh, Isha Vashyam Idam Sarvam Yat Kincha Jagat Yam Jagat Dena Chak Dena Bunjata Magridaha Everything animate and inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should accept, therefore, only those things which are necessary for oneself, and one should not accept more, knowing well to whom it all, to whom it all belongs. So, very important inst instruction. Take your, your quota. Don't be greedy for more. Just act for the bare necessities of life. Minimize our needs. Keep our life simple. That is the mode of goodness. You know, sometimes, you know, you go to people's homes. Recently, I, I was at, somebody took me to their home. And goodness, I went in one of the rooms. It was like a shoe shop. She had so many <laughs> shoes, you know, so many pairs of shoes. I thought, wow, my goodness, you know. <laughs> and, you know, people live like that today, you know, so many, so many handbags, you know, a handbag for this dress, a handbag for that. And, oh, you know, and the wardrobe of an average woman. Prabhupada said the average woman will not be happy unless she has about 30 saris. <laughs> right? <laughs> no response. <laughs> Confirmed, right? So the average man, you know, not pa one pair of shoes, you know, pair of jeans. <laughs> Men live a, a very different life. It's because you're a woman. Women need these things, you know. I and mean, if you're a businessman, if you're doing, you have to have a suit and things like that. You have to dress to meet the people. Just uh, you know, devotees, you know, we have to have devotee clothes, you know. Yeah, so, but minimize the, the needs, keep it simple, right? Kavi Chandra Swami calls it the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> KISS, K-I-S-S, -S. keep it simple, stupid. If we're not keeping it simple, then we're stupid. We're in, we want so much, we have so many demands, so many needs, we, I need this, I need that, I need more, I need this, not enough, give me more. And we're never satisfied. That is not the mode of goodness, right? We heard, one who is self-realized, we heard last night, they're satisfied. It's important, control the mind. Keep it under control. Don't listen to the demands of the mind. And keep ourselves in the mode of goodness by minimizing the demands. Living simply. Being satisfied with basic needs. Bare necessities. That's what we should be, how we should be living. Uh, one time, I was on a traveling, I was to go on a traveling party with Sasvarupa Goswami. <laughs> Sasvarupa Das Goswami. It was a long time ago. He doesn't travel now, you know, he's very old. Huh? But, uh, and he, he had a bus and he was taking us, you know, I was a brahmachari, I was on one of the bus. He, the, he said, every one of you, he said, whatever you take in the bus, you must be able to tie it up in one piece of cloth. That's as much as we were allowed to take, you know. We shouldn't have a big accumulation of things. Oh, so many books and so many clothes and shoes. Oh, so many different paraphernalia. We think, oh, I need this, I need that. And people have so many books. You go to their home, they've still got the plastic on them. They never even opened the book, you know. They never, what to speak of, read it. They never even opened it to look in the book. So that, that is not the mode of goodness, you know. Keep it simple, minimize our basic needs, you know. Keep what you, what you need, what you're going to use. If you're not going to use it, pass it, pass it off. 
Hanumat Prasak Swami, a very nice devotee. Does he ever come here, Hanumat Prasak Swami? He's a very interesting devotee. He was very close with Bhakti Swarup Dhamadhar Goswami. So anyway, Hanumat Prasak Swami, uh, he's an American, travels in South America. Uh, he was telling me he was at Rathi Atra in India one time. It was up in Punjab somewhere or Haryana and uh, it was quite a cold day and he was out there and they were having the parade and they, they came past a shop and one man in the shop said, gave him a chadar, he gave him a chadar, put a chadar on and Hanuman Prasad told me, oh very nice, took the chadar and a little while later he gave it to a brahmachari because he thought, I don't really need this chadar, you know. He passed it off to a brahmachari and further down the street another man came and somebody else gave him a chadar. <laughs> And the whole afternoon he got about five or six chudders, so all the brahmacharis all got chudders. You know? <laughs> so that, that's how it should be. You want to minimize, keep it simple. You don't want to collect, you know. Upadesha Amrita talks about things which are very bad for our devotional service. And the first one, Atyahara. Atyahara, meaning overeating and over collecting. It can mean over eating but it can also mean over collecting. We, we collect, we, we, this, this is a consumer society, you know, and we accumulate so many things, we collect so many things. Oh, and then the technology changes and it all goes out of date, you know. We used to have uh, cassette tape recorders Nowadays nobody has cassette player, you know, cassettes are all out of, after cassettes then it became CDs, right? Now even CDs, you know, nobody has a CD, it's all, you know, USP drive or something. The technology changes, you have to move with the technology from time to time, you just have to throw everything out, get rid of everything. One couple said to me, one householder couple, they said, we were, th she, she, they said, we were thinking of joining the Hare Krishna movement again. They said, when we first came to Krishna consciousness, we got rid of everything. Because we thought, we're going to move in the temple, we're going to become devotees. They got rid of a lot of stuff and they became devotees. So they moved in the temple, became devotees. After a while, you know, they're devotees. They, they got their own house, they're living near the temple. but. I get their, their devotees you start accumulating so many paraphernalia and so many books, so many clothes, so many big bags, so many things you have. And she, she, the, the couple were saying, I think we need to join the Krishna conscious, we'll join the movement again. <laughs> you know, get rid of everything, begin again, make it a lot easier. That way, minimize your, your, your life, you know, keep it simple. You don't want to be collecting more than what you're using. It, it's a problem for some people, you know. Some people, they, they cannot part with things, you know. Oh, those are my old shoes. No, I want to keep them. No, you never wear them, you know, you, but you're attached to them. Do you have that problem? Maybe. <laughs> 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 so anyway, try to minimize the, the, our needs, keep it simple. And then Krishna, Lord Krishna said, thus working, he is not affected by sinful reactions. He is not affected by sinful, he doesn't do anything sinful, but you know, of course, you know, we have sinful reactions from the past because we've taken birth in this material world. The fact that we have taken a birth here, we have taken a material body, it indicates we have some sins, we have some karma from the past. And that's why we are here in this material world. We have desires from the past. That's why we've come into a material body. We have attachments and we did some things which were not proper. We didn't know what's the proper standard to behave and we do sinful activities. So if we are, if we are fixed in the proper consciousness 
then the sinful reactions will not come upon us. Because devotional service will burn up all the sinful reactions. Transcendental knowledge will burn up all the sinful reactions. Just like a blazing fire burns wood to ashes, the fire of transcendental knowledge will burn up all of our past sinful reactions. But we have to be fixed in that transcendental knowledge. It's not just knowing something, but it's applying it. I know I'm not the body. We have to apply that I'm not the body. We have to act like a spirit soul. How does a spirit soul act? A spirit soul will act in the service of the Supreme Soul. They'll act in the service of Lord Krishna. That is proper use of the human life. We have to recognize the, what is the proper activities for a self-realized person, for a devotee. What is the proper action for someone who is a Krishna conscious person? What did Prabhupada do? Prabhupada, was, he would show the devotees, he said, kirtan, something cooking for Krishna, writing books for Krishna, worshipping the deities, preaching, like this is the business of devotee. Shravanam, kirtan, Vishnu, smaranam, padasevanam, archanam, vandam, dashyam, sakyam, atmani, vedanam. This is bhakti yoga. Nine, nine different types of devotion, beginning with hearing and chanting, which are the roots of the creeper of devotion. And we need to give a lot of time and a lot of importance to hearing and to chanting. It's, it's how our creeper of devotion will develop. We've got some seed of devotion. The creeper, the seed, of, the seed has been planted by our contact with the devotees. Des described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Brahmanda Brahmite Konya Bhagyavan Jeev, Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai. Yes, the Bhakti Lata Beach, Beach, the seed, the seed of Bhakti is planted by contacting the devotees. And that is our good fortune. When we are very fortunate, we contact the devotees and we get that seed of devotion. Once the seed is there, then we have to take care of the seed. We have to water it regularly, hearing and chanting. Just like you plant seeds in the ground, you have to water them. Of course, here in Zurich you get rain every day. You know, <laughs> you know. But still you have to pull out the weeds, you see, still the weeds are going to grow, you know, you have to, you have to be able to distinguish what is the plant and what is the weeds. If we don't know, we pull out the wrong thing, you know, the, the, weed, the weeds grow. So we have to recognize what, are, what is obstructing the growth of this bhakti lata, the creeper, this creeper of devotion. We have to keep watering it, not fencing it, to protect it, because sometimes the elephant of offense may come in and the elephant will trample everything. Everything will be ruined. So you have to fence around the creeper so it can grow nicely. And it has to grow, it has to grow out of the universe, it has to penetrate the covering of the universe enter into the spiritual sky, enter into the spiritual planets and take shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord. And then the fruit will begin to grow. The fruit of that creeper, that is love for God, love for the Supreme Lord. That is the purpose. So it's a process, it's a process. We have to follow the process and go through these different principles in order to get the result, to get the goal. We cannot expect it all to just happen mechanically, naturally. No, we have to, we have to regularly 
faithfully hear and chant. And that is why when you get initiation, the spiritual teacher had you vow to chant every day, 16 rounds. We, make, we made that promise to our spiritual teacher. You know, he wants to know that we will do this chanting faithfully and strictly follow the regulated principles. Then the creeper can grow. And, but if we, ne if we neglect these things, then the creeper will be in trouble. It will, will definitely, the growth of the creeper will be affected. So we have to follow strictly. We have to be chased to the teachings given by our spiritual teacher and follow them. Then if you follow, you get the result. But if we deviate, then we get problems. So Lord Krishna is describing the qualities of one who is self-realized, how he, how he will be detached from the world. Although he's living in the world, he's detached from it all. And in this way, he doesn't get reactions from... We are all suffering. Why are we suffering? Sinful reactions. Sometimes we get, we get karma from our community. We get karma from the country we're in. You live in a country, you get particular karma. We live in... We're part of a, 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 a family. There's a karma there in the family. The money which the family has, you know, has a karma to it. And we, we are using that money, and there's some karma there. And so we're, we're all involved. We're, we're all caught in this net of karma. How to get rid of all that karma? Simply by surrendering, by taking full shelter of the devotional process then the karma can all be removed. Karma is not eternal. It can all be destroyed by devotion. Okay, are any questions? Where's that lady who always had questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. And two questions if you allow. Okay. One is that we often hear from Chaitanya Charitamrita how the fruit of the creeper of devotion, it bears the fruit of love at the lotus feet of Krishna. And therefore we, we engage in Shravanam and Kirtana. And at some point you do feel that there is some love in the heart also. When you, even in the beginning stage, when you do try to engage in Shravanam and Kirtana. So what kind of love is that? What kind of love is it that we have in the heart in the beginning? We've just come to Krishna consciousness. That could be a shadow or a reflection of the, the real love for Krishna. Just like sometimes people come to Krishna consciousness and they, you know, they, they come and see the deities and they may cry, you know, in ecstasy. They may cry seeing the deities and they feel you know, some kind of ecstatic symptoms, although they're very new devotees, but they feel these, they have these feelings. So that kind of love which you're talking about, which we have initially, that, that is, it can be a shadow, because although we have some kind of love, we don't maintain that love for long. You know, that we have, some, at some point we feel some love, but then we, we get diverted, the mind goes away to other things. So that's an indication that the love is not 100% pure. That there's some attraction there, but it's mixed with other desires. So people who have that shadow attachment, they should be encouraged to follow the principles and to take up the practice of sadhana bhakti seriously and very faithfully hear and chant. And in that way they can go on to develop pure love. What's your other question? That you spoke of this aspect of simplicity and 
in the past few months I moved a lot and I was also thinking of this aspect of simplicity and then um, I was thinking of, uh, it's very stupid to think like this but then I, I at least when I processed a lot of aspects of my life then I was really thinking of how um, I was raised in a certain way and I'm, I'm in the body of a woman so I have a certain kind of tendencies also there are certain kind of tendencies but at the same time you understand as devotee simplicity is quite important so how should a practitioner, a young practitioner balance these two that you know that you have certain tendencies because of your conditioning and at the same time you also see how simplicity is very conducive to spiritual life yes Yes, we, we, have to, we have to balance these things. You know, you cannot be artificial. You know, you can't just... I mean, as you say, you were moving a lot. That's a good way to get rid of things, you know. Every, every time you move, you lose some things, you know, and you get rid of things. And, uh, and you know, I'm moving all the time, I know what it's like. <laughs> Practically everywhere you go, I'll leave something, oh, you know, I forgot this, I forgot that. And so you're always, uh, when you're always moving, it's difficult to keep things. And so that's helping you to minimize your uh, wardrobe and <laughs> other things. But, uh, yeah, you, you, as you say, you're a woman, and you, so I, I said most women, they're going to need at least 30 saris or whatever, you know, you. The women certainly have to dress appropriately, you know, we cannot just give you a, an old pair of jeans and say, you know, live in these for the next six months, you know. <laughs> you have to, you, we have to be practical, uh, we have to understand the need, what, what is the needs, according to your, you know, your situation. As I said, if someone's a businessman, then they have to dress appropriately. You know, if you're a businessman, you meet your clients, you know, they'll look at how you're dressed. You know, if you come in an old t-shirt and stuff, it may not give the, the clients a very good impression of them, of you, you know. So you, you have to dress appropriate, appropriately for your occupation. If you work in a bank or something, you know, people, you know, working in a, a big office, a corp multinational corporation, you know, you have to dress according to that situation. To, uh, uh, so, uh, similarly, women, they, they have to also dress appropriately, they have to take care of their, uh, their emotional needs as well as their physical needs. At the same time, you try to keep it simple. You just, you know, you have to keep analyzing, do I really need this? Don't be artificial, but at the same time, you know, be practical and think, you know, how much do you really need these things and are you making use of it? You know, I said something, we keep things, you know, you never use them, you never, win. what's the point of having it, you know? One devotee was telling me, no, oh, it was Buri John, you know Buri John? You know, Buri John is a very, he wrote that book, Surrender Unto Me. So he was saying, he used to be in Gita Nagari, I think it was Gita Nagari in America, he was on the farm there, and he had a luggage, you know, with his family, he was there with his wife and his children, and they had some luggage and everything, and he left it there, he couldn't carry all the luggage, and, and years later he went back, and he found the luggage and he's looking and he said, it's all useless stuff. He said, I don't know why I saved it, you know. He put it in the bag, but years later he looked at it again and what's it, you know, useless, you know. And so, it's quite common, but like that, you know, we have things that, well, why did I keep this, you know, it's useless. It's a mind, the mind thinks, oh, I need this, I need that. So yeah, you we have to you have to constantly check, you know, and try to always keep it simple, keep it basic. At the same time, you know, have your needs, but don't uh, indulge in excesses. Keep it 
basic, just essentials, what you really need. Until you get settled somewhere. Now when you're settled somewhere then you can be a bit different, then you could you can relax a bit more. But when you're in a transit situation, you don't want to be accumulating a lot of things. Yes. Um, I'm actually having a question from two days ago. <laughs> you were speaking about love and we were speaking about how maybe I also got it wrong, please correct me. Um, how love is mis misguided, giving it to animals, for example, or other people. Um, but in my understanding so far, since we are all part and parcel of God, how is it like misguided? How how is it misguided? Isn't it nourishing to God as well if we give love to other creatures and plants and whatever? Did I get it wrong? Well, to give love to other living entities, we have to understand love is meant for Krishna. You see, love for other things is more. It, Love is it's not meant to be just based on the body, a physical thing. But love is to actually understand the spiritual nature of everyone and every living entity. The person who we really love is Krishna. You know, we may think, I love my dog. Huh? Do you really love your dog? You know? I mean, some people really love their dogs, you know. I mean, they think they do. You see how they carry them and how they feed them and they, you know, they sleep with them and ev oh my, everything, you know. And, and it's unbelievable what they do with dogs today. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, we won't get into the dog category. But the point of love is misplaced. Love is meant to be given to Krishna. The person who we really love is Krishna. It's that person who's in the body. You don't love the body. When a person dies, you're not going to embrace that dead body. Oh, my loved one, you want to keep my loved one with me. You know, it's the body. The body is just a dress. It's not the person. Oh, I love my dress. Do you love your dress? Yeah. Well, the dress gets old you, and you, it gets worn out and you, you, you get rid of it after some time, you know. You have to. You know. And similarly with the body, our love, what we, th what we think of love is not really love. Real love is to give to Krishna. The person who we love most, who we really love, is Krishna. It's the soul that we love. It's not the body. So when we speak of love for other living entities, it's to understand them as spirit souls. Uh, Prabhupada went to this one uh, Christian monastery in Australia. He was in Australia and the devotees had uh, got Prabhupada an invitation to this monastery where these monks were living. And they were followers of a Christian saint, St. Francis of Assisi. Have you heard of the name? St. Francis of Assisi. So, you know, he, and, and they were telling Prabhupada, he said, St. Francis used to talk to the plants and the flower, my dear sister flower, my dear my brother tree, like that. And, and he actually saw all different living entities as brothers and sisters. And Prabhupada heard this, they told Prabhupada, like this Prabhupada said, oh, he said, that is real God consciousness. He said, that is God consciousness. To see all living entities like that. That you see them as souls. So that is love. We love the soul. The person who we really love is Krishna. There's a pastime where uh, Brahma had stolen away the cows and the cowherd boys 
and Lord Krishna took the place of all the cows in the cowherd boys. <coughs> And Brahma had taken them away for a moment of his time, which was one year on this planet. So for one year, Lord Krishna had expanded himself to take the place of all the cowherd boys and all the calves, who the, which they were taking care of. So they were all Krishna. All the calves and all the cowherd boys were Krishna, actually. But they were in the, the different dress, you know, they looked like the cowherd boys and the calves look like calves but actually it was Krishna. Krishna expanded himself to take their place. And what happened was one day they were walking with the calves and the, and the cows were up on the Govardhan hill and they saw the calves down below and they all came running down the Govardhan hill. They all came, all the cows came running down the Govardhan hill and they, they were so eager to come to the calves. And not only did the, cow, the cows come, but the cowherd men who were up on the hill, they also came down. Of course, they come down to get the cows, but when they came down and they saw the boys there, they embraced them and they hugged them, and the cows were giving their milk to the calves. Although the calves had already grown, the cows were giving so much milk for the calves. And Lord Balaram was looking and he was thinking, what is this? What is this? And he was surprised to see. And then he understood. <laughs> because Lord Krishna had never told Lord Balaram that I'm, you know, I'm taking up the place of all. Lord Balaram, but then Lord Balaram figured out what was happening when he saw this. And, and Prabhupada writes there that this is a proof that the person who we really love is Krishna. That the calves, the cows loved the calves because they were Krishna. And the coward men loved the coward boys because they were Krishna. The, what, what, the person who we all love is Krishna. But we give that love, with, uh, we're misdirecting that love because of our ignorance. So we can, de we can develop that love. The more we chant the Maha Mantra, the more we worship Krishna and serve Krishna, then our, our love will awaken. Okay? Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai Srimad Prabhupada Ki Jai Hare Go Thank you.